All right, welcome everybody. And thank you so much, Marcelo and Anand, for joining me today on this webinar. We have a lot to work through today. So while we're letting people roll in, I'll share a, a breakthrough that we had this morning. I have two five-year-old daughters and they have lately been trying to tell jokes very unsuccessfully because they don't understand the, the setup and the punchline. It, it doesn't work. But this morning, my daughter, Lily, while we were getting ready for, for kindergarten, she looks up to me and says, where do cows go when they want to watch something? And I said, where? And she said, they go to a movie. And I completely lost it. And she was like, yes, like I got one. <laughs> it was a really powerful moment. So yeah, that has been my morning before, before this webinar. Um, the way to start the day, right? Yeah, exactly. So we have a few people joining in. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I have with me today Marcelo and Anand. Maybe while we're giving people just a couple more minutes, Marcelo, can you just briefly introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcelo Ribeira. I'm the VP of Product Manager here at Endor Labs. So I lead everything product. Uh, I've been with the company for about a couple months and Really excited to be launching uh, these new capabilities today. It's glad that you're all here. I've been in the AppSec space for quite a few years before Indoor Labs as well. So I'll be looking forward to the feedback and all the questions that we might get today during the call. All right, amazing. And just to remind everybody that you can engage in the chat or the Q&A at any time. If you have any questions, just pop your questions in there and we'll try to get all of them. And if we miss anything, We'll follow up right after. And Anand joining us from deep in quarantine. Yeah. Uh, how are you doing, Anand? Still got COVID, unfortunately, for the second time in a month. But I, yeah, no, I'm doing better. But I'm Anand. I work as a engineer in our static analysis team here at Endor. My job mostly is to do all the reachability stuff that we're going to be talking about soon. And been here for about a year. And most of the work that I do currently, thankfully, is very related to all the research I've done previously in my life. Uh, during my PhD and postdoc, this company is like the perfect place for me to be. Amazing. So I think we can go ahead and get started. I'm Ron, by the way. I'm on the marketing team, but I wasn't always a marketing guy before I sold out and moved into marketing. Was all, I was a QA, QA engineer for a little bit. And, and a product manager for a little bit, but I was not good at any of those things. So now I'm in, I'm in marketing. Let's talk a little bit about what we're here to talk about, which is reachability analysis for Python Go and C Sharp. We'll talk a little bit about what Android Labs is just to, to level set and get on the same page. And then we'll dive very deep into what reachability analysis means specifically for Python, because we have a very interesting use case for Python, and we'll also go through demos for all three languages. But of course, let's kick off with what we're announcing today, which is the ability to prioritize reachable vulnerabilities for Go, Python, and C Sharp. If you take anything away from our presentation today is that you are now able to prioritize reachable uh, vulnerabilities at the function level uh, for Go, Python, and C Sharp, along with all the other languages that uh, we already support, which we can uh, get to uh, in the end. One of the key areas of focus for Endor Labs is prioritizing risks that actually matter when you're managing open source risk. So we have done that for other languages as well since day one. A big part of that is basically building a model of how your application behaves and understanding which code is actually being used. We've done some research in the past that says that a very small percentage of the open source code that you import actually gets used, which is why focusing on reachability analysis typically cuts down the amount of security noise that you have to deal with. And when we talk about why these languages specifically, I think the answer mostly is, is obvious and comes from customer adoption, right? These are languages that are exploding in popularity and specifically Python is seeing an explosion in popularity due to um, AI. And everybody is sick and tired of hearing about AI, but one more thing about it is 
that there are a lot of risks associated with it that I think that we are starting to imagine for ourselves that will come manifest themselves into existence over the next few years. And we should definitely be mindful of those. But also the increased adoption of uh, Python, for example, just exacerbates some of the existing things that we need to be on the lookout for uh, just from how the language is built, which is why we took that as a really interesting case study and uh, uh, forced Anand to come and do this uh, webinar with us. Um, no, he's willing. He's not under duress at all. It's fine. <laughs> Let's dig in really quick just to level set a bit about what Ender Labs is, then we'll jump right in. What our co-founders, Varun and Dimitri, when they ran Prisma Cloud for Palo Alto Networks, they had an engineering team of about 500 people there. And obviously they had a big reliance on open source and managing risk for open source is a huge endeavor. I'm not gonna belabor the point that open source is here to stay and we all have a huge reliance on it, but it is also one of the biggest areas of waste when it comes to engineering cycles. It, it gives us a pretty hefty productivity tax on the way that we secure and, and ship secure open source risk. The three areas where that tax is heaviest typically is the amount of developer time that is wasted uh, chasing after false positives and chasing after security uh, noise that is usually produced by SCA tools. We'll go over a little bit why that is true for Python today and some of the other languages, but these concepts are the same across languages. Another area is the risks that are unaccounted for. So we tend to really focus on really just license risk and uh, CVEs while we're not really paying attention to things like we're using a package that is 75 versions out of date. And if I update it, everything will explode or things that are outdated, un unmaintained, uh, no longer supported by the community. And finally, there are emerging compliance standards, specifically around SBOM and VEX that really present a new burden for application security and developer teams. And these are interconnected because if our scans are inaccurate, our SBOMs are going to be inaccurate, our customers are not going to be happy. So this creates a huge productivity tax, a huge burden. If any of you have ever watched the uh, little skit that we did, it's on the Ender Labs YouTube channel, where a lot of these meetings between security and engineering feel like litigation, basically like a courtroom hearing, then this is the reason why. And I'm just so proud of that uh, sketch. So I want to plug it uh, everywhere that I can. So the tools that are out there today, specifically SCA tools, really tend to focus on two out of the top 10 open source risk. And this list, the OSS top 10, is a list that we've put together with the Station 9 research team and over 40 CISOs and CTOs that have contributed to this list from companies like Citi and Adobe and Discord and a lot of other companies, you can find the full report on our website and mitigation tactics for each. But the point is that we typically only look at known vulnerabilities and license risk. And beyond that, we typically look at these in direct dependencies. So if we know that about 90% of code in modern applications is open source, most of that 90% is the part of the iceberg that's underwater. Right, Most of that 90% is not the direct dependencies that your developers hand select and bring in to your code base. It's the transitive dependencies that are being automatically brought in to your code base. And we typically tend to, fo to focus only on that first layer of direct dependencies and looking at known vulnerabilities and license and uh, regulatory risk. One of the big problems that we're gonna be talking about today is that the way we come up with the list of known vulnerabilities is by looking at a manifest file and then showing you all the vulnerabilities that are associated with it, as opposed to looking at is what is actually happening in the code. So what does Ender Labs do? Ender Labs takes an inside out approach. First, we scan the open source ecosystem and we look for leading risk indicators when you evaluate, when you do risk analysis with Ender Labs, you're not only looking at CVEs, you're looking at the popularity, activity, human risk, what Jamie likes to call the bus factor of these open source projects, which I know is like a popular term, but I've never heard it before. When Jamie did an OWASP talk and then very casually said, what if all the maintainers of this thing get hit by a bus? And I was like, 
Okay. And everybody was just cool with it, but, but I guess that's a thing. But we look at the backwards compatibility, malware, risky APIs. So you can make an informed decision about selecting better dependencies from the get-go before you bring them into your code base and also codify that into Rego-based policies to make it easy for the developers to, to make better decisions. And then once your code, once that code is in your code base, that is where Anand kicks in. That is where static analysis uh, kicks in. And that is where without any runtime agents, we're able to essentially model how your application behaves and reap all the benefits that gives us better visibility, better accuracy, uh, understanding which vulnerabilities are actually reachable, more accurate SBOMs, understanding the uh, impact of, uh, of updates and optimizing your, your application by removing, for example, outdated uh, dependencies. So just to wrap this uh, part of the presentation up, uh, Android Labs is an end-to-end -end open source uh, governance solution. It helps you select better dependencies from the get-go. It helps you prioritize risks that actually matter. We do this by focusing on reachability analysis. Uh, we've had customers that have seen anywhere between 70 and 80% reduction in their false positives. It helps you reduce your technical debt by consolidating versions, removing unused dependencies, and optimizing updates. And then finally, it helps you comply with uh, new regulations around SBOM and NVEX. We have an interesting question here that says how we evaluate human risk. And I'll take a stab at it, but Marcelo, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong. We look at the activity and trustworthiness of maintainers. We look at a few things. We look at first, the activity on a project in the last, let's say 60 or 90 days. We also look at things like, is this project corporately sponsored, for example, or, and what's the number of maintainers that are on it? So there are a bunch of metrics around the people maintaining the projects that we look at. Marcelo, anything you would add to that? Yeah, no, that's about right. I think we also look at any risks that potential legitimate projects could be introducing malware, for example. Some a contributor could try to slide some malware into a project. That's an area of, that we do have research and we're ongoing, always looking for opportunities to identify some of the situations in the code as well. Anand, let's maybe do a little recap of what reachability analysis actually is, what it means, maybe level set a little bit, and then we can dive into specifically how we tackle it. Sounds good. So as Ron mentioned, something that we do at Endor is we care about the prioritization of your vulnerabilities. So what is the current state that happens in your project today, right? You have first level of dependencies, your direct dependencies that you declare in a manifest file somewhere. Each one of these dependencies brings in something transitive. So when you look at the, the picture in the middle, there's going to be a bunch of transitive dependencies that are brought into your code base just by default. Now, some of these packages might have vulnerabilities associated with them. And when you go and scan these packages or your entire dependency tree, that's what any other SEA tool would do. It would tell you, okay, this transitive dependency has a license risk, or this transitive dependency has a vulnerability. But are you actually affected by that? That I think that's the core question we ask here at Endor is while we can tell you that you have a vulnerability, we does not mean that the vulnerability actually affects you directly. So Ron, if we can go to the next slide, what we do is we create a call graph from your code that reaches the first level dependencies that goes all the way down to the transitive dependencies to see exactly what your function calls are and whether or not they actually reach something at the bottom of your dependency tree. So in this example, where there were two vulnerabilities and a license risk, one of these vulnerabilities actually is not even reachable. The vulnerable method is not reachable. So what this means is you, as an AppSec team or engineering team, can look at this and say, hey, we don't really need to do anything about this vulnerability. Transitives are anyway not in our control, so we'd have to change a direct dependency if we wanted to mitigate this risk, but we don't have to do anything about it. But we do have to do something about the other one. And that's the kind of prioritization that we try to do with our reachability analysis today. Currently, this does work for 
Java. And as we're announcing today, for three other languages that hopefully give you the exact same results as we do have for Java. Just to, to clarify a little bit, does it work like in, for example, in this one with the red box, I might have 10 different methods and only one of them is actually uh, being used. And the vulnerable one is just one of the ones that are not being used. Would that be the, right. the use case here? Correct. Right. So if you don't use the vulnerability, we will not show it to you as a reachable function. Mm -hmm. And that is what our prioritization is about. So even if the dependency is reachable because you're using stuff from the dependency, it doesn't mean that the vulnerability is reachable. Those are two different things. And that's important to remember. And if the vulnerability is not reachable, then you, you don't have a risk. And that's what we try to show to, to the engineer. In the case where the vulnerability is reachable, which is the case on the right, we show you a full call path starting from your client code that goes into the first direct dependency into the transitive dependency, all the way down to the lowest transitive dependency and show you exactly how we get to that function. So you can either, I don't know, change the top call at the top or you change your dependency, whatever is your way of dealing with it is something we, is it's your choice. We give you maximum information possible, but in the case where it's not reachable, odds on you don't have to do much. Got it. There's a question here. How do you initially identify the vulnerable method or function? We do have our own proprietary database of this. What we start off with is with the CVEs. We find the commit that introduced the CVE. We find the commit that fixed the CVE. From the fixed commit, we identify what functions were affected. We also look at the documentation that the package might have put out about what exactly what, what was affected or what what the risk is from using a vulnerable method. Based on this, we annotate the exact library call that is vulnerable. And when we do our static analysis, we check whether or not this vulnerability is then ac accessed. But it is our own proprietary database and it is hand annotated. Okay. So, and this could also be the use case where the really the only type of prioritization that you typically have is by criticality. So this could be we've had instances with customers that maybe vulnerability is high or even medium, but it's actually reachable. And by fixing it, you would be fixing a bunch of issues. So it, it goes into this whole thing of you need to make prioritization work for your specific situation, right? Not just based on external factors. Okay, we have a, a few more questions, but I'll get to them in a little bit because I just want to be mindful of, of time. Do you want to talk to this a little bit, uh, Nant? Uh, now, the other question is, what are your dependencies and whether or not you're really affected by vulnerability, right? This is a manifest file which declares dependencies, um, uh, I think about seven dependencies and, and version ranges, in this case, minimum version that is needed. But declaration is not usage. Just because you declared this dependency, it does not mean that you actually end up using A, the exact version that's in here, and B, the you don't even have to use the dependency. You might have just declared it just for fun. So just blindly looking at these manifest files and then trying to trying to understand what vulnerability may or may not affect your application is pointless. You need to know exactly what is being used, how it's being used, where it's being used. And that is what gives you maximum insight into whether or not a vulnerability actually impacts you. Mm -hmm. So the, so there's a situation where I declare something in the manifest and then it's not actually being used, or is it typically the other way around where I don't declare both. something in the manifest and then both. I end up using it? Both, right? You have both. You can declare in your manifest, you don't have to use it. Just because you mm -hmm. declare it doesn't mean usage. Manifest files are not always in sync with what's actually in the code. Mm -hmm. So you could be using something that you haven't declared in your manifest file. This is something that happens typically in Python anyway. Mm -hmm. But you can also declare something in your manifest file and not use it. So I think Go is the only language that disallows that because the compiler is tied very directly with the package management framework. But for Python, for NPM, for uh, Java, you don't have to, it doesn't matter. 
Like you could declare 300 dependencies and use one and you're going to still be fine. But but any other SEA tool out there is just going to look at all these 300 dependencies and try to give you some sort of vulnerability information irrespective of usage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then you will be basically end up with potential risks and vulnerabilities that you don't know about. So you get into this whole situation of a false negative is more dangerous than, than a false positive. Well, a false negative is dangerous, but that's the case when you haven't declared the dependency even, right? Mm -hmm. So a false negative definitely is more dangerous, but at the same time, you also end up with a ton of false positives, which is also just useless mm -hmm. because at that point you're looking at 5,000 alerts and you don't know what to do. Yeah. yeah it's a mix of both. And I, I responded to some of those questions on the chat run about the false negative versus false positive. So I tried to, that's one thing that we, we were very careful about when we were doing our static analysis, if we can't clearly assert that a, a vulnerable function is not reachable by the application will not claim that it's unreachable okay because we we have three states basically reachable unreachable and potentially reachable mm -hmm. but what we find is that there is a lot of the unreachable code base out there that is just uh, creating a ton of noise for security and development teams yeah the way that our cto dimitri explained this to me once is that if you have a range, he might have used like harsher language, but the vanilla version is that if you have a range where on the one hand, you have traditional SCA looking at manifest files and spinning out a lot of vulnerabilities, creating a ton of noise, that is the one side of this range. And then the other side is runtime, where it typically is uh, too late um, and also requires a ton of test coverage and requires uh, instrumentation. Um, then what we do will be the best of both worlds where we don't require a runtime agent, um, uh, but uh, we are using static analysis in order to understand what is actually reachable. So you're cutting down the amount of false positives very, very severely, but also you are not getting any, any of the false negatives that, that you might with some of the other methods. I know it's more nuanced than that, but, but also we don't have all day. Well, uh, so one yeah. question I would like to ask, I mean, I know they, they it's not interactive, so they can't answer us, mm -hmm. but how many of you engineers have hundred percent test coverage that a dynamic agent would actually work and have tested every possible input, which is one of the reasons why a dynamic agent probably wouldn't work just as well as a static analysis way of doing this. Your propensity or your potential, sorry, for more false negative exists with dynamic approaches as opposed to our static analysis approach. Yeah. Marcel, let's kick it over to you. Yeah. So let's uh, just do a quick recap here. We all know, like how we've been in the industry for a long time. We all know that most of the software that we ship today is based on open source package. But when we take like the reachability analysis that and, and the call graphs that Anand was talking about, what we realized was, look, out of, yeah, 90% of your, all your code might be open source. But the reality is when you analyze how much of that open source is actually getting used by your application, it's a minuscule fraction of that. And on average, like our research shows about 12%. And... When you combine this reachability analysis with this proprietary database that goes, identifies vulnerability all the way down to the function where they exist in an open source package, we're able to eliminate a lot of the noise. Because imagine if you're only using 12% of the, all that open source code and the portions of that application, of those packages that you're using don't have vulnerabilities, you don't need to worry about it. Okay, that's basically the, the simplest way of summarizing everything that uh, Anand talked about. And what we see is 80% of all that those vulnerabilities disappear because they are unreachable. And we allow security and development teams to start focusing on what truly really matters. And we give them the evidence of how that vulnerability is reachable. We give them the entire call path so that they understand that they can evaluate much more quickly do the triage and the remediation plan for how they're going to solve the problem. We're going to spend a lot of time in today's call. Our focus is going to be on Python. And uh, like Ron mentioned in the beginning of the call, the, this is an easy choice for us because Python is on fire due to AI. Everybody's talking about AI. Everybody's building new applications. There is a, a, an exponential influx of 
new open source packages being uh, published daily to help AI applications written in Python. And a lot of the enterprise customers when they talk to us, they're concerned, right? They're concerned because there is this new class of applications that are emerging so rapidly within their environment. And what we find is that when we analyze all these open source AI packages that are getting published, they're not different from any other regular package written in Python. They are still, they still have vulnerabilities. They are still highly exploitable like any other package. So the risk is still the same. And, and go to the next slide, Ron, because I think this is, and Python is so interesting, right? From a, a dependency management perspective, it's quite unique. And what we find is that most of the, actually it's one before, I think. The reality is when we look at the dependency management for Python, the most of the applications are only scanning the manifest file, which is this requirements.txt. And this requirements.txt is typically outdated. It's not maintained in a reasonable way. When everything starts on a happy note, when a new project begins, the developer will say, hey, I'm going to build a new application. I, I'm going to rely on these two new dependencies. I'm going to update my requirements.txt file. Before I, I run my application, I'm going to run a pip install against this requirements.txt. And people take care of installing everything that I need, my direct dependencies, the, the transitive dependencies. And if I want to package this, I look at my virtual environment, I can patch, package all these dependencies and ship this to somebody else. But this derails very quickly. Next slide, Ron. What happens is as new developers come in, they start building, they, they start relying on more dependencies, they start bringing new dependencies. They will, a lot of times they will either ignore the requirements.txt file because they don't want to deal with it, or they'll just forget about it and they will just start doing scripts. And that's the norm, right? Like I'm going to rely on scripts that are going to do all the pip installs that I need upon runtime. I'm going to rely on the OS specific package manager to do some of this stuff. Or I'm just going to create an assumption that this packages need to be available in the system in order for me to run. So I'm just going to update my documentation. As a result, this requirements.txt file becomes completely useless. It's no longer a definition of what this application really needs from a runtime perspective. And so any SCA tool that tries to, who relies on this requirement.txt file to tell you what this application depends upon is, is going to give you garbage, right? Garbage in, garbage out. They, they're doing the best they can by looking at this requirements file, which has a couple of dependencies, but now this application relies on 10 other dependencies that never made it into this into this file. Okay. So next, so if we want to do this right, if you want to do this properly for Python, what you need to do is you need to go to the source of truth of the application, which is the actual source code. And you need to understand what are the imports that this application relies upon. And then you need to be able to correlate those imports to specific packages and their corresponding versions so that we can have a clear understanding of what are what is the real risk of uh, running this application right now. Once you have done and you have found all of those dependencies, their versions, et cetera, now you can build a call graph. And a call graph for the entire application with all of those dependencies, the direct and trans transitive dependencies. And then you place this annotated database of vulnerabilities that Anna talked about, and you figure out if those methods in those packages are reachable via your call graph or not. And that's the real SCA for Python, okay? So I wanna take the time now to transition and, and give, let's, let's give you guys a demo, right? Let's talk about how we actually do this at Under Labs and explain the process of how we are doing this and how, what is, how different is a view where you just rely on the manifest file from for a real project versus taking on a deeper analysis of the actual application. Right. We're going to run this demo against this project called Baselines from OpenAI. I've already set up the virtual environment. I've, I've got the code. And we're going to run what we at Endor call a quick scan, which does what any other SEA tool out there in the world does, right? Which is look at the manifest file, look at the virtual environment and just based on the manifest file in the virtual environment, do a pip list or a pip depth tree or whatever you want to do and understand what the resolve dependencies are going to be. And, and that's it, right? Not, nothing fancy, nothing special. We're pretty fast on this one and we should have results. There we go. 
when we look at it here, we have 11 dependencies for this OpenAI based loans project. And this yeah. is what every other vendor in the market does, right? So we have the same capabilities as quick, but yeah. Uh, okay. Correct. So if, if we look at this baseline setup.py, it has a few declared dependencies and it's readme, however, tells you that you need to install some other stuff, right? Tells you that you need TensorFlow and you need a few other packages. And this is very typical in the Python world. I think Ron asked me about this earlier as well. Is, hey, what if you don't have it in your manifest? And that is very traditional in Python. So what we do instead is let's run a full scan here. And this is where we actually do stuff a little better, where we're going to look at the imports of, of what you use. And based on your imports, we're going to track the first level dependencies and their transitives, et cetera, et cetera, until we get a full dependency tree, right? And this is very different to what others do. Yeah, so just give a give an analogy. I think that's the Ron was talking about yesterday, right? This is a, if you go to a restaurant and... The waiter comes by, you place your order, and 10 seconds later, you have the food at your table. What is the expected quality that you're going to get from this food? And I, I think you, what we found is that a lot of our customers, they're choosing for quality of results. They're willing to wait a little bit up front, really incur some of this cost on really triaging this information automatically by the system rather than having to rely on now their development their security teams to evaluate this myriad of uh, false positives that they get on a daily basis without, if the data is garbage, like I'm, I'm going to be spending way more time than waiting a, a, a minute here to, for this to complete. This is a normal trend. I don't know, Ron. Or... So I have two questions. One, Anand, is the like best practice, let's say the OpenAI project, it said I need to import a bunch of other stuff is the best practice to then go back to the manifest files and update it and it's just a thing that no one actually does or is that not the expectation it's very project dependent right for a lot of the ai based projects i think it's expected that the environment provides the numpy or the tensorflow or the torch implementation but for other customer projects that we've seen the expectation is yes you go up to your manifest and don't because for basic packages you don't need to do this Mm -hmm. So it, it's very context dependent. And my second question, the, so if you compare quick scan, uh, your standard SCA scan with what we're seeing here, which obviously takes longer, the main difference is the building of the call graphs and understanding reachability. That's the, that's basically well, what is well, different about this. So first thing is the dependency resolution that we do, which is what we're showing over here, which is, Hey, now we have 47 dependencies compared to 11 that we just had with the quick scan. And on top of that, we go and do the call graphs and start looking at reachability. So we're doing two things in addition to what other traditional SAA tools would do, which does take us a bit of time because we have to do some code analysis. Admittedly, it did take about what, 130 seconds as opposed to about 20 seconds. But as Marcel was saying, for gourmet food, you do have to wait a little longer. And this is gonna this would take hours and hours of triage, right? If you if you didn't do this up front. So that's the trade-off that you're getting out of the system. And once you've done it the first time, right? Like, like a, this is not gonna take that much longer the mm -hmm. second time. So to uh, re re to recap this, you did the quick scan, which looked at the manifest, and you came up with eleven dependencies. And then you did the deep scan, which took longer, built the call graphs, did all the fancy stuff that you spend all your day doing, Anand. <laughs> and and then we came up with 47 dependencies, meaning that if I had any risk in those 40, 47 dependencies, and those 47 dependencies, the difference there is things that weren't in the manifest were added later, were added in different ways. Right. And now you would also get visibility into the risk. Correct. We didn't see TensorFlow earlier, right? It's not openly declared in their manifest. They tell you to go install it separately here. And now magically we have TensorFlow. We have the right one, which is the Mac OS distribution of TensorFlow. And that shows up as a dependency. And we get all of its transitives as well if we were to look at the full tab graph. Now we can give you a real picture of what you're using, more version of what you're using, and what vulnerabilities truly affect you. So we don't suffer from a false negative problem here in the sense we would not miss packages that you do actually use, but don't explicitly declare. 
Okay. Um, and that separates us from our current competition, I guess. So before we jump into the the vulnerability and and call path demo, let's just quickly, Marcelo, if you can walk us through just how this works with us, how we do it, and, and then we can jump right back in. Absolutely. Yeah. Like we, we talked about before, everything, the single source of truth is the actual code. So if you're not looking at the code, you're not looking at the imports in the customer code itself, you're going to miss some golden nuggets because you're relying hundred percent on a manifest file that is most of the time outdated. It's about use the code to be the guiding point for what are all the dependencies that I have. Okay. And for each dependency traverse that tree and understand your direct or your transitive dependencies all the way down to the next leaf. Step two is create this full dependency graph and as bump. And here's where you would also like to identify those imports. You're matching the imports to the actual packages. You're also looking at your file system to understand what are the versions that were installed in the system so that you get a complete picture of everything that is needed for your runtime. And then let's also identify if there are any mismatches in terms of relationships, because as an example, another use case is I might have, I might be now using what used to be a transitive dependency from one of my direct dependencies, I might start using it directly. And if you, I didn't update the requirements of the txt file, I wouldn't know this. So it's about really showing a, a real map of how the application is relying on this, right? And creating a real software build material that a customer can rely upon that is the real description of what the software is, okay? And step three is then once we have all this information, we can build the entire call graph, understand, combine with our vulnerability database, understand which vulnerabilities that exist in those packages are actually reachable in the context of this application so that we can eliminate the noise of the, all the other stuff that is unreachable and let you focus on what really matters, okay? Yeah. So front. yeah, and you can see, this is just a, a screenshot that we grabbed a little bit ago. And so this would be the actual call path that shows you how this traverses from your code all the way to the vulnerable uh, method. So an example of a reachable vulnerability. So I think that we can just use our last few minutes here. And by the way, amazing work on just being on time and also doing a live demo on a live webinar is brave. I've I've had some, I've had some close calls, so let's take a look at, at a couple of these projects that that I have here. So this is a different project than the one that Anand was looking at earlier. So typically, what what we do in most of these uh, situations is we will go and filter by severity. We will look at our criticals and we will look at our highs, which will really not cut down our noise by a lot. We will take a look at show me my critical vulnerabilities. And these usually will be the ones that I will throw over to engineering without much context. But here I'm also able to take a look at the actual tags about reachability. So I see, for example, this one is an unreachable function in a reachable defend dependency. I see that this one is a reachable function in a reachable dependency. So let's filter this down a bit more and take a look at one of these. And I can see the actual call path here. And I have a few examples of, of these here. But these are the examples of, of these projects that I have here. And as we said, we also had um, a few other interesting examples here. Here's the same thing for Go, where again, this is going to look very similar. Uh, which is why we chose to focus most of our time here. But did you see, if I'll just uh, quickly remove this filter, these are all the findings that I have here. Most of these are security findings. Andro Labs does do other types of findings that are more on the operational side, like outdated dependencies or license risk, or even things that are a bit more about your pipeline. But for the purposes of this demo, we're talking about these, these vulnerabilities. And when I filter this down to just what is function reachable, then I'm all the way down to one, and this will look very much the same, right? I get some context, some explanation here, and then I get the actual call path here. We have one customer. So one session that, that I really recommend that you go and watch, if this is interesting to you, is on the last Lean AppSec uh, virtual event, we did a session called Reachability Analysis 101, where Joseph on our team 
teamed up with Greg Pettengill from Five9, where they talked about reachability analysis more in depth. So that is a full primer and explanation on how reachability analysis works. But what I really like that Greg then pointed out is he calls this the smoking gun, right? This is the evidence that you go back to engineering with to say, hey, here is why this needs to get fixed now and why we can deprioritize other things. Let me take a quick look here. I think we are coming up on time. Marcelo, was there anything else that, that you wanted to talk about before we wrap up and before I just talk a little bit about more information that people can find? No, I think this is great. I'm looking here to see if there are any additional questions. I think a new one came up. Do you handle get attributes, set attributes? You responded already, Anna? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very you, by the way, you want to cover live here for the team as well. That's okay. okay we do <laughs> <laughs> a short answer. Yes. So a couple of things just before we, we wrap up. One is that we have another lean AppSec event happening on October 18th, where we have a lot of really amazing speakers. Two of the sessions are about this topic specifically about how do teams prioritize vulnerabilities? We have people from Docker, from Twilio, from Endor Labs, from a bunch of other great companies talking about even outside of Endor Labs, what do they implement in order to prioritize vulnerabilities and prioritize risks in uh, general? And the last thing I'll plug is if open source security is a matter of concern for you and you need just training, some educational resources on an introduction to open source security, then on our website, you can find the Lean AppSec Academy. It's an hour long course. We're working on having that qualified for CPEs as well. It's an hour long course that just gives you an introduction to open source security. It is vendor agnostic, just gives you all the basic concepts around, the, uh, around compliance risk, security risk, operational risk, and just concepts that are very useful. We've been getting really good feedback about it. These webinars that we do are mostly driven by feedback that we get from everybody attending. First of all, huge thank you to everybody who attended today. And let us know if there's anything specific you'd like to like us to cover. Uh, you can find me at ron at endor.ai. Send me any question that uh, you might have. And most likely, I will go hunt down Marcelo and Anand to actually get you an answer. But I will get you an answer. With that, thanks, everybody. Marcelo and Anand, thank you so much for spending you your morning with me. All thanks. right. Bye. Bye, everybody.